The next few moments are devoted to silent prayer. That gives each of you as a believer priest the privacy of your priesthood to rebound if necessary. For if we name our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to purify us from all wrongdoing. When we name our sins, we are filled with God the Holy Spirit. God the Holy Spirit is our mentor and our teacher and the one who brings to our memory those things we have forgotten. So with that in mind, let us pray. Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege and freedom to assemble ourselves together for the purpose of learning your word. May God, the Holy Spirit, enlighten us and challenge us by what we note. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen. I have a brief section of an article that comes from the UK Daily Mail. A lot of the news that I receive comes from the British news because... Uh, their news is a bit more fair. They are not as vested in our own politics as many of the people in the media are. And most in the media are totally unfair and biased. But here is the exclusive. The federal government are building a detective squad to target consumers and companies that don't follow Obamacare's rules that headline itself should send chills up your spine. What they're doing is criminalizing law-abiding citizens. Post-Obamacare law hiring at the Department of Health and Human Services included 86 criminal investigators, but just two consumer safety officers. On the day President Obama signed the Affordable Care Act into law in 2010, Health and Human Services received authority to make 1,814 new hires. The authorization included positions for 50 criminal investigators. The agency increased that number to 86. The agency was also authorized to hire 261 consumer safety officers only two such employees were hired. This article was written by David Martosko, and uh, he is part of the Washington Bureau of the UK Daily Mail, 21 August, 2013. The criminalization of the law-abiding citizen is what is occurring, and we are losing our freedom. If they can criminalize us, for not purchasing a service that the federal government demands us to purchase, then where does it end? It doesn't. Under the health care law, they'll be able to criminalize us for many things. Whatever they decide under the health and human services bureaucracy that will not be monitored, or it should be monitored, but it will not be monitored by Congress, it will be its own bureaucracy. They will make their own rules. And more and more, criminalization of law-abiding citizens will occur. We've lost our freedom. And we've lost our freedom because believers have not made Bible doctrine in enough numbers, percentage-wise, number one priority in their life. They have not in any way executed the protocol plan of God. They do not know the basics of Bible doctrine, such as the rebound technique. They reject the grace that is found in 1 John 1, 9, in which we are to only name our sins to God, not feel sorry for. That word in the Greek is metomelomai. It's not found there. If we name homo logeo, that's what's found there. And that's the word of God. If you want to argue with that, you're arguing with the word of God, and you don't need to be listening to me. Because that's all I'm going to teach. And the only thing you're going to do is get mad and turn it off anyway. So don't get mad. Just turn it off now and go elsewhere. For if we name our sins, 
He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to purify us from all wrongdoing. And people don't know that most basic and important of doctrines that is not a license to sin, but a license to live the spiritual life. And people don't know how to live the spiritual life. They don't know what the meaning of the filling of God the Holy Spirit is. They attach to it some emotionalism, some so-called second blessing that isn't found in the Bible, but made up, man-made. They run around acting like fools, running up and down aisles, frothing at the mouth, jumping up and down, listening to some, nowadays with the younger people, listening to some rock music that's not even, that has lyrics that aren't even related to the Word of God, but related to how great they are. And they jump up and down and raise their hands, and they think this is spirituality. What if you don't have any hands or legs? Can you then not be spiritual? What if you're a paraplegic in a wheelchair and you can't move at all? Can you then not be spiritual? Think, people. The spiritual life is a system of thinking. It is the filling of God, the Holy Spirit, plus the system of thinking related to converting gnosis, academic knowledge, into epinosis, beyond knowledge, doctrine. And that conversion is made by following a system. And that system is being filled with God the Holy Spirit plus sitting down on your butt and listening to the Word of God and then it involves in your daily life thinking in terms of Bible doctrine and applying Bible doctrine from the extension of that thinking. A paraplegic can do that, but a paraplegic can't run up and down an aisle Yet a paraplegic can be just as spiritual as some nut who's healthy, running around and acting insane. Furthermore, Jesus Christ lived the prototype spiritual life. That means he lived the very same spiritual life that we are to live and passed it down to us, though we will never be able to take it to the great heights, nowhere near the great heights that our Lord did. Our Lord Jesus Christ acted as the test pilot for the prototype. It was as if he was given the F-22, very fine aircraft, and he was told, take it to the limit. See what it will do before it falls apart. He found out there were, now this isn't true in real life, but he found out in the spiritual life, no flaws no flaws whatsoever to the prototype spiritual life, then he passed this spiritual life with no flaws to us. Yet because we were born into depravity and because we have the old sin nature with us after salvation, we will never be able to take it to the heights of our Lord Jesus Christ. But as pilots of the spiritual life, you never are supposed to. You don't max out what your plane can do. And in fact, the test pilot uh, comes up with a system, and then they write it all down in a manual as to what the aircraft can do and how far to take it before it becomes dangerous. The test pilot takes it to a danger point. You do not. And in that manual, the plane will probably be able to do more, but I wouldn't try it. So then they make protocols of the F-22, which I believe they've stopped doing now because we've cut that out of the military. Stupid decision. It's the new generation of the F-16. And the F-16 is a fine jet, but they have uh, stopped spending on it, while the Chinese have stolen the technology and have created their own form of the F-22 and are building it hand over fist. And they've stolen our stealth technology and are building with that. They may be the nation that takes us out under the fifth cycle. I'm not a prophet, I don't know, but it's possible. And under the prototype spiritual life, I can tell you one thing. As you go through Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and you see what our Lord Jesus Christ did on the earth, and in Matthew it focused mainly on what he did 
under the concept of the age of Israel, for Jesus Christ was born a Jew under the age of the Israel, under the Mosaic law, and he fulfilled the law. But I can tell you while he was doing all of that, he never did get emotional and run around and jump up and down and say, praise God the Father, and froth at the mouth, and raise his hands, and do anything that the people do in Pentecostal churches and in many other mega churches around this country. He did not do that. So when you do that, you are not following the protocol. Therefore, you are not fulfilling the protocol plan of God. Therefore, you're a traitor to your country. You may have not known that before. This may sound harsh. We'll snap out of it and get with it. Because what I'm teaching you is the word of God, not some man-made system, not something that is, as it were, as the Bible says, a form of the spiritual life, but having rejected its power. I'm telling you how to have that power, an unseen power, an invisible power, a power that can save this nation and turn the world upside down if enough believers get with Bible doctrine, but it's not happening. And that power is related to the filling of God, the Holy Spirit, and the power of Bible doctrine. And the power of thinking Bible doctrine while being filled with the Spirit. Nothing more, nothing less. Well, I'm going to do a very quick review, and I also want to make clear, even though I made it clear in the last message, what the sabbatical year of Israel is all about. Since I got the details wrong the first time around, I want to make sure it's solidified in your mind what it is, and also so I'll be able to easily recall it to my mind when need be. So the most important client nation in all of history, and the key to all client nations, is found in the history of Israel as a priest nation. God directs and controls historical activity on the basis of client nations. Client nations hold back a lot of evil that otherwise would occur. <clears throat> a client nation is responsible to do five things. Number one, it must evangelize its own population at home. Fail. Number two, it must communicate Bible doctrine to the believers in the nation. Fail. That might be something new to the older generation, but when somebody does something stupid, we just say in our generation, fail. And sometimes they'll post funny things on Facebook, some guy trying to ski or something else, and then he falls on his head, and then we might write something like epic fail. Well, let's call this epic fail. Number one, it must evangelize its own population at home. Epic fail. Number two, it must communicate Bible doctrine to the believers in the nation. Epic fail. Awesomely epic fail. Not awesome, but you know what I mean. Number three, it is responsible for the custodianship of Bible doctrine. I don't know of any other country that has custodianship of Bible doctrine, so as of now, I guess it's still here. That's why we're hanging by a thread. Number four, it provides a haven for the Jews. We've elected leadership that doesn't seem to be too fond of Israel. And no client nation can survive anti-Semitism. And whomever we elect reflects the attitude of the population though they probably wouldn't know what Semitism was. We live in an ignorant society. We spend more per capita on education than any country in the world, and yet we get nothing out of it. People graduating without even being able to read or analyze, or much less, analyze the English language. It provides a haven for the Jews. Well, we're hanging by a thread. It is responsible to send out missionaries to evangelize other nations. Epic fail. Now there were five Jewish client nations in the Old Testament. Number one, there was the theocratic kingdom 
from B.C. 1441 to 1020. This was the 420 years in which Jesus Christ ruled the theocratic kingdom, yet he was not present on the earth. But he was the ruler. After 400 years, the people went into degeneracy and apostasy, and they cried out for a king. Then Samuel cried out and took it personally. And then God had to go to Samuel and say, Samuel, stop having a nervous breakdown. They haven't rejected you. They've rejected me. Allow the people their freedom and let them decide to have a king and we'll give them a king. But before you give them that king, just do this. Warn them that they are going to be taxed out the wazoo, regulated out the wazoo. Uh, they are going to be enlisted in the army. There's going to be a huge draft. You will be enlisted to serve the king, and you will become servants of this king. Warn them of that. So Samuel did. And they said, yes, that looks pretty good to us. Just like we look at socialism and say, yes, we want, uh, we want to serve the government so we can get a little piece of the pie. And we, did the, we do the same thing. And 49% of Americans right now receive some form of government assistance. So the theocratic kingdom followed by kings and kings reigned from in the United Kingdom. You see there's the United States. We've basically been split along the what's called the Mason-Dixon line. Even after the Civil War we recognize the Mason-Dixon line. We recognize the different cultures between the South and the North. We recognize uh, the, the different accents of our language between the North and the South along that line. And that line almost delineates exactly where you will speak like a Yankee and where you will speak like a Southerner. One time we went to some place and I bought something and my mother was speaking and they said, where are you from? She said, Ohio. He said, it must be Southern Ohio. Well, see, she lived most of her life in South Carolina, and she hasn't lost that southern accent. So, so he knew that, uh, <laughs> he knew it wasn't Ohio where she was originally from. He was joking. Although there's a slight twang in southern Ohio, but as soon as you cross that line and get down into Kentucky, well, it sounds like you're in South Carolina all over again, right along that Mason-Dixon line. You go from Maryland, they sound like Yankees, into Virginia, sound like Southerners. Then you have the great migration of the North down to Florida, they sound like a mixture of all sorts of things. Those who have migrated sound like Yankees and they've had an influence on those who've lived there. Although those who live out in the country areas, like Gainesville, they sound Southern as a South Carolinian go to Miami and they speak a whole other language, Spanish. Anyway, we have, we have in our history had problems between keeping our country united. Well, they had a united kingdom from Saul to Rehoboam. And then Rehoboam, being a stupid king, had the great idea to split the country between the north and the south. Now, Abraham Lincoln had a greater idea. He said, we will keep the Union. Well, Abraham Lincoln was obviously much smarter than this Rehoboam fellow. And Rehoboam said, I'll take the South, and then I'll allow another king named Zedekiah, or another king named Hosea, or Jeroboam, excuse me, to reign in the North. So we had Rehoboam in the South and Jeroboam in the North. But from 1020 to 926 B.C., there was a united kingdom of Israel. Then after this guy made this stupid decision, this king, the northern kingdom went from Jeroboam to Hosea, 926 to 721. Then the northern kingdom went out before the southern kingdom. But don't worry, all the 12 tribes of Israel ended up in the southern kingdom. Some historians like to say, well, some of the tribes were wiped out because of the fact that they were destroyed in the northern kingdom. No, there were enough who had enough Bible doctrine who were part of that remnant who got the heck out of there when they knew it was going to happen, when they knew the fifth cycle was coming. They left and went to the southern kingdom 
where the pivot still remained. And then the southern kingdom, of course, was under <clears throat> Rehoboam. That's the part he wanted to take over. All the way down to Zedekiah. And they lasted from 926 to 586. So both the northern and southern kingdom acted as client nations from 926 to 721. Then mainly, then after 721, it was only the southern kingdom. Altogether, in the southern kingdom, they lasted from 926 to 586. Then the fifth cycle of discipline was administered by the Chaldeans under Nebuchadnezzar, of whom we have studied, later on became a believer, and great visible heroes during that 70 years of captivity like Daniel came to influence the history of the Chaldean and Persian Empire, yet there was no client nation during those 70 years, for it was the time of the Jews, and there could only be a Jewish client nation. So there was no client nation on the earth during that 70 year period from 586 BC until 516 BC. Now, why was it 70 years? And I pointed out to you, without having any notes in front of me concerning that, that that 70 years had, it, had significance. And that 70 years had to do with the sabbatical year. And so for 490 years, they did not follow one sabbatical year. And the sabbatical year occurred every seventh year. Take 490 divided by 7, and you get 70 years. They would not follow the sabbatical. And what is the sabbatical? The sabbatical was simply a test of Israel to see if their pivot was large enough to where they had a, an authority system uh, in which they had good leadership from that pivot that would say, okay, it's the seventh year, time to stop working, Israel goes on vacation for one year, see you next year. But no leadership came that would do that. Therefore, they missed every single sabbatical year for 490 years. And of course, the sabbatical year was a test of the pivot and a test to those believers in Israel. Would they utilize the faith rest drill and relax during that one year of vacation and understand that the Lord would provide as he always had even though they were not working. It was a demonstration of grace. It was a teaching tool of grace. They weren't working. God provided. And God provides when we're working too. But he specifically made a one-year Sabbath sabbatical. That's where we get our word sabbatical. You might have a, someone, some preacher say, you know what, I need to take a long time to study and I don't have much time I just am not going to have time to teach right now so I'm going to take a sabbatical to go study and that's happened before I've heard of stories where the pastor was positive and he had an unruly congregation and he just didn't know what to do so he would write Baraka Church or TNP and then TNP would send him all the materials that they had books tapes all of it and then they would say to themselves, there's so much material here, I'm going to have to go on a sabbatical. And what they would do is stop teaching and simply study and study and study and study for however long they want. I think I heard that guy did it for a year. It's a guy in Chicago, I don't remember his name. Maybe he did it longer. But then he came back and he knew a lot more and can teach. Because it's better to teach one good day of Bible doctrine and a thousand days of apostasy and stupidity and ignorance. So it was good that they took the sabbatical. And it was good for Israel to take this sabbatical because it was part of the law. And it was part of them to orient to the faith rest drill and also to orient to grace. God does everything for them. They can stop working in the New Testament, it's even more profound. Ephesians 2, 8, 9, It is by grace you have been saved, through faith and that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. They had the same system of salvation. 
in Israel. So, but they needed teaching tools because they had a deficiency. And that deficiency is the completion of the post-canon era, which is what we live in, the post-canon era of the church age. And in the church age, there were so many phenomenal things. Moses wasn't even allowed to see them. Otherwise, he would have envied us. So it turned out that the Jews failed in this area. Epic fail. They did not follow one sabbatical year during the 40, 490 years they functioned as a client nation. So God in his magnificent sense of humor said, well it wouldn't be very funny to them, but it's funny to us. He said to them, all right, you didn't follow my law. You didn't follow one sabbatical year for 490 years. You will pay back those 70 years by going into slavery under the Chaldeans. And that's exactly what happened. But Jesus Christ controls history. And what happened from there is the fact that Nebuchadnezzar became a believer. Otherwise, he never would have. Many people in the Chaldean and Persian Empire became believers. Otherwise, it wouldn't have occurred. So God knew what he was doing, and he did it in love. And he also did it in love toward Gentiles, even though it wasn't the time of the Gentiles. But please note, this is the time of the Jews, so there was no client nation during that time. So the divine meanings of history has always been, or has always revolved around client nations, ever since the inception of Israel as the first client nation. The most important client nation, of course, is Israel. So the Chaldean and the Persian Empire were not client nations between the times of 586 B.C. and 516 B.C. Then we already studied the fact uh, that it returned to Judah, and we studied how that happened under freedom through military victory, in which the military was built up first, then they went in and claimed the land once again, and that would be the land of Judah, which would last until August of 70 A.D. And because of negative volition once again, and this time negative volition against their own Messiah, the Christ, the Son of God, their King, their King of kings and Lord of lords, because they rejected him, and because uh, most were even unbelievers, and those who were believers immediately went back to the Mosaic law, and they weren't supposed to. They were supposed to move on into the unique spiritual life of the church age as there had been a change of dispensation. But James did not recognize this. And if he did, he forgot about it. And James went into reversionism and so did the entire church in Jerusalem. There was no pivot. So Jerusalem was destroyed in August of 70. A.D. So again, there were periods of apostasy in Israel in the Old Testament, and every time it occurred, it's a cancer. And we have a cancer right now in the United States of America, and we are in the third stage of cancer, moving rapidly to the fourth stage of cancer, if we're not already there already. Because Abraham Lincoln once said, this nation will never be destroyed unless it destroys itself. That's a profound statement of history of all client nations. We destroy ourselves first on the inside, and then an outside force takes us out. But we are definitely, no doubt about it, under the third stage of cancer. That would be the third cycle of discipline. Under the third cycle of discipline, there can still be surgery, but it's going to take surgery, so it's still going to hurt. Under the fourth cycle of discipline, the fourth stage of cancer, there can still be surgery, but it's really going to hurt, and most likely not going to happen. Surgery and chemotherapy, all those things that cause great pain for a cancer patient, if you've ever been one, you would know it. I've never been one. But I know that chemotherapy 
uh, interacts with your neurological system and causes extreme depression and everything else and no loss of appetite, loss of hair, and uh, chemotherapy makes you about as sick as the cancer because the chemotherapy is trying to kill the cancer and at the same time kills your own immune system. But they're coming up with some new things for cancer, but with this new type of system of health care coming in, uh, we might as well write that off. Then the fifth, the fifth cycle of discipline, that's it. No chance. Fifth stage of cancer, you're dying. And the client nation dies. And in the church age, that client nation does not return. It's over. Jeremiah 6, 13 through 14. For from the least of them, even to the greatest of them, everyone is greedy for profit. Furthermore, from the prophet, P-R-O-P-H-E-T, that is the one who should be teaching doctrine, even to the priest, the one who goes through the ritual in order to teach doctrine through ritual, everyone manufactures lies. They're deceitful. And what do they say? These would be the politicians of the land during Jeremiah's day. In fact, they allege to solve the problems of my people, saying, Shalom, Shalom. That's a greeting in the Hebrew, meaning peace and prosperity. And they say, peace and prosperity, when there is no peace. Ezekiel 13, 10 through 16. It is definitely because they have misled my people. See there again, deceit. Deceit of the politicians. And they say, peace and prosperity when there is no peace and prosperity we have that going on today if you watch any of the news channels even well Fox News is the one who gave me these figures but any news channel outside of Fox News any medium that you use to get your information is going to paint or whitewash a wall and make it look pretty and they say this, why, under the Obama administration, one million jobs have been created. That's over a five-year period. They failed to tell you that in 1984, during one month, the Ronald Reagan recovery created one million jobs in one month, and they were full-time jobs. A million jobs in five years, that doesn't even keep up with population growth. Furthermore, this is a true statistic, 77% of those new jobs are all part-time jobs at McDonald's or Wendy's or wherever. Part-time minimum wage jobs. And that's why our income for the first time in history under a quote recovery has declined by 5% and is continuing to decline that's not a recovery. We're in trouble. Things are getting worse, not better. And they did the same thing during Roosevelt's day. And today they've distorted history and they've said, Roosevelt got us out of the depression. If you were to go on the street and ask anybody, they would tell you the same thing. It's because that's what they learn in history. That's what they learn in school. That's what the media tells them. Actually, the correct way to say it, that is what the media tell them. Media is plural. And that's what the media tell them. So they believe it. They soak it in under Matayotes. The economy did not get better until World War II, in which, manu in which we had to manufacture a military out of nothing by God's grace. We had the industrial capacity left over from the great roaring 20s to do that. And we could out-create any nation in the world. And we turned out bomber after bomber after bomber after tank after tank. Must have shocked Hitler out of his mind if he could be shocked. If he wasn't shocked, he was shocked when we were bombing his facility and he had to stay down under there with his cousin, woman cousin, and they could feel the thing shake, Ava Brown, and they could feel it shake all around. We dropped so many bombs, it's unbelievable. 
tons upon tons of bomb during, during one bombing raid. Tons upon tons upon tons of bombs. And we obliterated anti-Semitism from the earth for a little while. Except for in the Soviet Union. It's always been there. And we didn't do as Patton said. What the hell are we doing disarming? Let's go get those Soviet, you know, you know how he talked. He was right. And Jews have ever since been persecuted in the Soviet Union and they are still persecuted in Russia today. And now there's a rise once again in anti-Semitism around the world as people forget what happened during the Holocaust. So it is definitely because they have misled my people by saying peace and prosperity when there is no peace. Now when anyone builds a wall, a, the political lies of politicians, behold, they cover it with whitewash, the false solution to the problems of the client nation. What false solutions today? Socialism, redistribution of wealth, big government, government cheese. That's not a solution to any problem. That causes problems. So tell those who plaster it over with whitewash that it will fall. And boy, are they ever plastering it over with whitewash. How are they doing that? Printing and, and borrowing money at such a rate that people can sit on their butts and receive a check. That'll fall. You can't spend $1.5 trillion, $1.2 trillion deficit here, $1.5 trillion deficit there. Deficits that have never been so high in all of American history, in all of world history. You can't spend that much money and not go broke or not have, eventually, a massive breakdown in the system in which inflation goes through the roof and that dollar bill you come around becomes as worthless as a penny. It's already becoming, if you go to the grocery store, you already know what I'm talking about. They can't hide it. I remember going to the grocery store with my grandparents in the, or my, what I call my nanny and poppy, papa, in the 80s. They'd flop out a $20 bill and the basket would be filled with everything I wanted and everything they wanted. You flip out a $20 bill now and you, you're in the line that says 10 items or less. Or you go to the individual scanner because you got about three items. Now that's inflation, and that's inflation, and they don't count food in the inflation index, but that is inflation, and food is a necessity. One of the things my friend from communist China, who came to live in the United States and is now a United States citizen, one thing he said is, food here is extraordinarily cheap. In China, Almost all of our income goes for food. But here, food is inexpensive. And he was poor <laughs> at the time. When you see food prices going up like that, that's real inflation. That's why they don't count it. I mean, we all need food. We don't all need an entertainment center. I know those get cheaper as they develop more and more and get a, a larger uh, portion of the population buying those things. But food's a necessity. And that's inflation, and soon it will hit everything. The only thing that has to happen is that the Chinese just have to get angry with us for really um, printing too much money, inflating. You see, what they do, what the Chinese do, is they buy our debt. And so do we buy our own debt. Some people do, but it's a low interest rate right now. But the Chinese buy our debt. We buy our debt. Um, other countries buy our debt. Uh, the feds buy our debt. And they buy our debt with an interest rate. Now, let's say suddenly this inflation kicks in. And we have this interest rate that we're paying out. And the dollar becomes 
less and less valuable. Guess what? That investment China made isn't so pretty anymore because what they hold is becoming more and more worthless. That's why China has warned us, would you stop spending so much? We're trying to make money off your money. We can't do it if you're going to inflate yourself out of this situation, and it's not going to work. You can't inflate yourself out, and we're ripping off the world by doing it. And all China has to do is get mad and say, you know what? We're not going to use the dollar as the international trading. It, you see the dollar is used world round as the standard. It used to be the gold standard. Now it's the dollar standard. All China has to do is say, we're not using the dollar standard anymore. In fact, we'll use the yuan because we have a surplus. We'll use our Chinese yuan. You want to exchange with us on the yuan? It has true value. And even some European countries and even our great allies that we think our great allies would switch right over to the yuan and the value of the dollar would crash. All of this might sound technical to you, but we're heading, I'm showing you how terrible things could get. And then at that point, you won't believe the inflation. It'll be like Germany during the time right before World War II in which they'd have a wheelbarrow of money to buy an apple. You don't think it can't happen? Don't fool yourself. I heard a lot of people before 9-11 say nothing like that could ever happen to this country. Boy, were they fooled. Then they get fooled over and over again. So then it talks about the political lies of the politicians. Let me check something here real quick to make sure this is still running so I don't have the same problem I had yesterday and to see how long I've been jabbering so I can continue into a new area. So tell those who plastered over with whitewash that it will fall. Who? The prophet should tell those that it will fall. And who are they telling? Israel, the politicians, the general populace. Who did Jeremiah tell? Well, Jeremiah got to the point where he was irritating Jezebel and Ahab. So they called him into the area and gave him a piece of their mind. And Jeremiah gave him a piece of his mind said, look, this is what the Lord says. You can't stop me from this. They tried. They couldn't stop him. Elijah did the same thing. Elijah did something stupid, though, but he got into power politics and decided on his own that all the priests of Baal should be executed. You know what he did. He forgot freedom. They have the freedom to follow whatever they want to follow. They have to make a choice from volition to say, I reject this. But instead, in self-righteousness and arrogance, he violated the freedom of those people to worship whomever they wish and killed the priests of Baal, what would be Baal. Well, that really irritated Queen Jezebel, when well, that wouldn't be Jezebel at that time, but it really irritated the leadership, the poor leadership. And then they decided, well, we're going to kill Elijah. Well, Elijah got scared, ran out into the wilderness, sat under a tree and had a nervous breakdown and asked God to kill him. And you know he's having a nervous breakdown because it's not reality. If he wanted to be killed, he could have just stood there and waited for them to come kill him. See what I mean? no common sense in it. But he had a nervous breakdown. He was under a lot of pressure. But that was part of his punishment. Then he recovered. And then we have the story of Elijah. And Elijah was always warning, you're about to go under. And Elijah taught his pupil, Elisha, his greatest of pupils. So Elijah taught and a pivot began to form. In fact, there was already a very small pivot because Elijah said, in self-pity, 
God, I'm the only one who cares about your word. I'm the only one who cares about Bible doctrine. No one else in this whole country does. And then God said to Elijah, Elijah, there are 7,000 who have not bowed knee to Baal. So there were 7,000 members of the pivot of mature believers, not just Elijah. And he taught those, and the pivot began to grow. And then Elisha came along, and it says Elisha was the greater, but that's not really what it means. Elijah was the greater. What it means is Elisha simply continued to teach doctrine, and there was a spiritual revival, and Israel was spared. The third cycle of discipline was removed and prosperity came back to Israel. Now either we are living during a time of Elijah and Elisha or we are living during a time of Jeremiah. Let's hope it's the Elijah-Elisha option, but we don't know. Either way, we can take solace in the fact that Jesus Christ controls history. A flooding rain will come and you, O hailstones, will fall in a violent wind. The fifth cycle of discipline will break out. Behold, when the wall is fallen, will you not be asked? Where is the plaster, plasterer with which you have plastered it? Therefore, thus asked the Lord, I will cause a violent wind to break out in my wrath. There will also be in my anger anthropopathism, which I explained in the last two messages. A flooding rain and hailstones to consume it in wrath. So I shall tear down the wall, the political lies, which you plastered over with whitewash, and bring it down to the ground, so that its foundation is laid bare. Furthermore, when it falls, you will be destroyed with it, sent unto death. Then you will know that I am the Lord. They'll be face to face with the Lord if they're believers. Therefore, I will spend my wrath against the wall and those who have plastered it with whitewash. Then I will say to you, the wall is gone along with its plasters, along with the prophets of Israel the, who prophesied to Jerusalem and saw visions of peace and prosperity for where there is, for her where there is no peace and prosperity, declares the Lord God. Turn in your Bibles to Hosea chapter 4, verse 1. Hosea chapter 4, verse 1. In Hosea chapter 4, verse 1 through 7, and Hosea chapter 8, verse 7, we will notice that the people become self-righteous, arrogant, legalistic, and reversionistic. There is also, on the antinomian side, a lack of any type of respect for the laws of divine establishment. And we will note they will be destroyed for lack of Bible doctrine. So let's take a look. Hosea chapter 4, verse 1. Hear the word of the Lord, you, O America, you could place there, you Israelites, because the Lord has a charge to bring against you who live in the land. There is no faithfulness, no faithfulness to the word of God, no love, no natural affection even, no acknowledgement of God in the land. There is only cursing. That means there is only the cursing of them because they have failed in the spiritual life. It's not referring to the fact everybody's running around cursing. Well, there is a cursing toward God because they have failed in their knowledge. This has nothing to do with cuss words. There is only cursing for you, would be a better way to put it. There is lying and murder. That's the antinomian side. Stealing and adultery, in which the divine establishment principles aren't being fall, uh, followed. They break all bounds, and bloodshed follows bloodshed. There is great violence in the land. Just as yesterday, these teenagers from Oklahoma, I forget the name of it, starts with a D, I believe. They just shoot a man because they say they were bored. Well, that's bloodshed following bloodshed. Because of this, the land dries up. 
third cycle of discipline, the job market dries up. And all who live in it waste away. Well, they fall into depression and eventually famine. And the beast of the field, the birds in the sky, and the fish in the sea are swept away. The prosperity is gone. There's not even food for the birds in the sky. It's so parched, the beast of the field leave. It's so parched, everything that was going to die died, and the birds had to go on and feast elsewhere. And the water got so hot, the fish in the sea were swept away from that area. Verse 4, but let no one bring a charge. This is where I can tell you, based upon scripture, you are wrong if you get into Christian activism and think you can change this country through politics or by going on some type of activism in politics or by symptom shadow boxing, like the nut I told you about in Spartanburg who was boxing at a man who didn't exist. And I'm sure he tore him up, but I didn't see him tear him up. You are symptom shadow boxing, and you have the only thing you're doing is punching a cancer patient. Think of it that way. You think you can cure cancer by punching the area that has cancer. You'll only irritate it and make it worse. Or you put a band-aid on a cut that needs a thousand stitches. Something like that. You get where I'm going with it. But let no one bring a charge let no one accuse another. For your people are like those who bring charges against a priest. What's that mean? You people are like those who bring charges against authority. We have authority in this country. The President of the United States, Barack Obama, is an authority in the executive branch he is the commander-in-chief of the armed forces. Therefore, the armed forces cannot say a peep about their commander-in-chief in terms of what they feel about him, whether good or bad. Well, they can say good things, but they can't say bad things about their commander-in-chief. Why? He's their authority. And in essence... He is our president and our authority as well. But you go from the president on down through our political system. But we say, he's not my authority, he's my servant. That's the way it was set up. Look, that's the way it was set up, but that's not the way it is anymore. And so he's an authority, period. But let no one bring a charge. Let no one accuse another. In other words, don't go around accusing the politicians. I heard that Congress has a 12% approval rating. You know what that is? Americans going around assigning blame for their own blunder. They vote them in and then they dislike them as if they had nothing to do with it. That's self-righteousness. Number five, you stumble day and night and the prophets stumble with you. This isn't referring to alcoholism. It's referring to the fact that they are stumbling because they have not the light of Bible doctrine. Although Israel has many times before the fifth cycle had problems with alcoholism, but that's brought out in Isaiah. So I will destroy your mother. That refers to to the country. My people are destroyed from lack of knowledge. It is the lack of knowledge that destroys a client nation to God. And it is obvious that among Christendom today there is an extraordinary lack of knowledge. There are probably, actually I know, 
I could probably ask 90% of the people who are believers in this country and ask them, why the Virgin Mary? Why did Christ have to be born of a virgin? And they would not know the answer, a most basic of doctrine. Do you know the answer? I know you do. But of those of you listening, if you don't know the answer, go back to the essentials. You'll get the answer. So they don't even have knowledge of that. They don't even have knowledge of how to give the gospel of Christ. They don't know it's faith alone in Christ alone. They're adding, they're adding things to it. Baptism. Either dunking of the water or sprinkling on. And they always have a big theological fight over which way it should be done. Well, for, so, for salvation, you don't need to do either. You have to understand baptism was a pre-canon function to fill a deficiency. It was a teaching tool because the entire Bible had not yet been written. So they needed a teaching tool. That teaching tool was baptism. And I guarantee you that 99% that of believers have no idea what retroactive positional truth means. And that's what baptism taught. They were already saved when they were baptized. And the baptism wasn't even an affirmation, except it was an affirmation that they knew that they had been saved. And that the theological term, retroactive, positional sanctification. And that, as we've studied in Acts, and we will continue to study, was there as a teaching tool to fill the deficiency of the fact that the canon, the full canon of Scripture had not been written, it has now, we're in the post-canon age, baptism is unnecessary. The only two rituals we have left in the church age is the Eucharist and marriage. Christian marriage. And of course, since it's a divine establishment, marriage between unbelievers. And sometimes a Christian will be dumb enough to ignore 1 Corinthians chapter 7 and marry an unbeliever. You might ask me, would I marry a believer to an unbeliever? Sure. Their choice, their freedom. And who knows, maybe by the behavior of the wife, if she's the believer, the husband will believe, or by the behavior of the husband, who is a believer, the wife as an unbeliever will believe. Furthermore, would I rather just them live in sin? Because they're going to do what they want to do anyway. They'll just go live together. Is it wrong to marry an unbeliever? Of course. But if you make that choice, you make that choice. And it's none of my business. And if and when I get ordained in March, and if and I ever have to marry a couple, I'm not going to ask them any questions whatsoever. The pastor always wants to sit down. Well, before I marry you, let me ask you some questions. Do you do this and then? Have you done this? What have you done? They even get weird about it and start asking their, about their sexual life it's as if it's any of the pastor's business they've messed up with sex before marriage that's between them and God or the individual and God it's not for the pastor I'll just say when do you want the ceremony now this is the way I'm going to give it because I am a Christian and I'm a pastor and I'm going to give it this way wives you must obey your husband will you agree to have that said they say, no. I'll say, find another one. Because the authority in the marriage and the way it's set up under authority, as per 1 Peter chapter 3, 
And the only way an, a believing wife can ever bring an unbelieving husband around is without nagging. And anyway, I won't get off track. But let no one bring a charge. Let no one accuse another. For your people are like those who bring charges against a priest. You stumble day and night, and the prophets stumble with you. In other words, neither the prophet nor the people understand anything of the word of God. So I will destroy your mother, your mother country. My people are destroyed from lack of knowledge because you have rejected knowledge. Notice, it's not saying one thing about sin. Why does a client nation go under? Because you have rejected knowledge, I also reject you as my priests. That means my priest nation. Because you have ignored the law, and that was under Israel. Today we would say the doctrine of your God. I also will ignore your children. Then I'll end there. Now look at Hosea chapter 8. I believe it was 8, 7. Let me take a look. Yep, 8, 7. They sow to the tornado. Corrected translation. Or, excuse me, this is the corrected translation. They sow to the wind and reap the tornado. The stalk has no head. It will produce no flower. Were it to yield grain, foreigners would swallow it up. Has that not happened here under the third cycle of discipline? We used to produce many things in this country under industry. We are no longer the largest industrialized country in the world. For the first time since World War II, China has surpassed us, and China is the most industrialized country in the world. And the most industrialized country in the world becomes the most militarized country in the world, if they so wish. I'm not a prophet, and I can't tell you it will be the Chinese coming over here. They have recently built their first battleship and with their industrial capacity I'm sure they can build a lot more very quickly. And do you know we only have 10, or not battleships, aircraft carriers. We, do you know we only have 10 aircraft carriers? It's the lowest since World War I. And do you know that the head of the Secretary of Defense has called for a cut down to two of those? Not two. He's cut, called for a cut of two so that we will have eight aircraft carriers. So while, the, while they build their first, their prototype, and then build their first, they will begin to build more, and it will become much easier for them to build more and more and more. And these idiots think we can get away with just using our long-range bombers and not having any type of navy. That is stupid. We don't even have enough long-range bombers to do the job. Furthermore, with our carriers, if we want to do something within 30 minutes, we have the capability to send shock and awe, as our last president would say, into the enemy. But if you've got to wait 18 hours, well, it makes a difference. It's a sad situation we find ourselves in. And then it says, if it were to produce flour, that would be, if, if our industry would start to produce something, foreigners would swallow it up. And boy, have they ever. Let's go down to South Carolina and look for a textile industry. It's gone. It's gone to Mexico. It's gone to China. There is no textile industry. So much so that the uniform 
the grand uniform of the United States military and their boots and their desert fatigue is made in China. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege and opportunity of studying these things. May God the Holy Spirit enlighten us and challenge us by them so that we might make Bible doctrine number one priority in our life and meditate on his word, your word, both night, day and night. And now unto him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forevermore. Amen.